What does a church believing for greater even look like? Let me tell you what I see. You guys doing well? Good, I like to give shout outs to football teams when they do well, and so I wanna give a shout out to my Longhorns who pulled off a victory. Hook them. Michigan fans, well done. Michigan State, come on, right at the end. We're praying for the, or the, 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 uh, the Broncos, uh, but we're in support of them, we love them. And uh, Notre Dame, we know that God loves you and you're gonna get through this. Um, but man, it's an exciting time to be in church, and, and man, I want to give a shout out to people who are watching online every week. You know, people travel and they get sick, and for whatever reason, they're not here. Uh, they're still a part of the church family, and so I, I want to invite you to welcome our church family online. Come on, church. Put your hands together. We just want to say we love you, and we hope to see you next week or the week after. Uh, I also wanna say a, a good morning and a welcome to you if you're visiting for the first time or coming to check out New Life Church. My name is Dan and I'm the lead pastor here and it'd be honored to even be able to meet you publicly and personally out in the lobby. I'll be out there right after the service. But we're in this series of messages called Greater. And, and the reason for it is we have, uh, we, we believe that Jesus wants to do something extraordinary in our lives and not just in our lives, but through our lives. And so I wanna show you this verse in the Bible, in, excuse me, John 14, where it says, whoever believes in me, that's Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, you'll do the same works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things, to which most people will go, oh my gosh, Jesus did some extraordinary things. And he's telling you, he's telling me that, that we will do the things he did, but even greater things. Why? Because he's given us the Holy Spirit of God to come and live inside of us. Those who believe in him will be filled with God himself. And so the things that Jesus did, he's given us the power to be able to do the things he was doing. And I want to tell you this, that so many of us, we live in a world where we, I'm going to go ahead and kick this off the stage because it's a screw and I don't want to step on that. Just needed a time out there for a second. Uh, what was I saying? Welcome to New Life Church. I'm ADD Global. We're going to get back on track now. But Jesus gives us the power. And so if you're sitting out there and thinking, man, I don't know how to get through this. I don't know how to do this life. I don't know how to live my best life, how to, how to impact people, how to, how to be a, a disciple who believes in him and does the things he was doing, but even greater things. I'm telling you right now, you can't without the Holy Spirit of God. You, you need the Holy Spirit of God in you to be able to accomplish the things that he has for us to do. And so during this series, we have a hope, and it's actually a hope that's found in the scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, we hope that your faith may grow. Why? Because if, if Jesus wants to do extraordinary things in your life and through your life, man, you've got to realize that it's not you that pulls it off. It's, it's he that pulls it off. Last week, if, if you missed it, go back to, 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 to week number one and listen to the message. That the disciples who were there were with Jesus, man, they only had limited resources. They had limited faith in and, of them, in and of themselves. But Jesus called them to do something miraculous. He said, man, I want you to feed not just the 5,000 people, but 25,000 people. And how, and, the, and how the disciples looked at themselves and like, we only have... Uh, a, a Long John Silver's basket of two fish and five loaves of bread, how, do, how is that gonna pull it off? Well, let me tell you, in your hands, you can't. But when you give it into the hands of God, when you give it into the hands of Jesus, he does something miraculous that you can't do in your own power. He multiplies it and gives it back to you to be a blessing. Now, how many of you believe that? How many of you actually believe that? Because I know that the disciples, they were sitting there going, I don't know how this is gonna happen. The math doesn't add up. Jesus, we need to send these people away so they can get fed and so they can experience. But you need to know something. We serve a miracle working God. And you need a miracle working God to come inside of you and to live and breathe and work so that your faith can grow and that you and I 
can accomplish greater things. Now, if you weren't here last week, I want, to, I want you to raise your hand because we gave you these books. Raise your hand loud and proud. If you're a worship host, come back up or really anyone. Just go get books and get these books into the hands of people. Do you not have a book? Raise your hand. There's a lot of you. Ready, go, run to the hills. Uh, students, run, run and grab books and just get them. Raise your hands high. A book for every single person. Okay, you, you, you get one because there's notes that you can take. In the back of these books, we have these broken out into week one, week two, week three, week four, week five. And so this is your guide throughout this series to be able to to take notes in. And we have a phrase around here that you need to embrace. Note takers are world changers. Let me say that again. Note takers are world changers. And so raise your hand high and we'll get you one of these books so that you can take note. And I wanna encourage you, bring these back with you. How many of y'all are raising your hand right now because you forgot? It's okay. We have another one for you. We have plenty, but bring these back with you over the next couple weeks or the next six weeks so that we can participate in this message together, dive in to hopefully have God increase our faith, greater faith, so that we can do greater things together. And as you're going, I wanna give you a little bit of an update. Um, I don't know if, if the website is on this book, but we have a website that you can go to to be able to see our vision and what's coming. And so newlifekazu.com, there is, if you go to our main webpage, newlifekazu.com, there is a link for you to be able to see things. You can see testimonies. You can see our ministry report, meaning what is it that we're accomplishing together? We see life change, we see testimonies, we see, man, this amount of money has been given to missions to expand the gospel, not just here in this city, but around the world. And so I wanna encourage you to go to newlifekazu.com slash greater to see that all the things that God is doing in and through you as New Life Church. So take a snapshot, go to that and check it out. The video that we shared last week is, is on there. And then of course, I wanna give you a, an update again this campaign that we're talking about is financial. Well, what does that mean? You see, as a church, I don't know if you know this, but really any entity, it, it takes some things for it to work. And so the church is no different. God uses two things to accomplish his vision on the earth. He uses you and I, people, right? If our faith grows, greater are the things that we will do. And he also uses the resources that God himself has given us. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. And so over the next 24 months, starting in December, we have a one fund target goal. What's a one fund? It means all in giving. We don't have separate funds going to this and that and, and, and something else, it's one fund. And so over the 24 months, our goal is to have $3 million over the next two years. Well, what does that break down to? It breaks down into two buckets, 1.7 to do ministry. So everything that we do from, from a worship standpoint, from, from impacting our city, missions giving is 1.7 million. Our new facility, it's gonna take $1.3 million for us to get in, into it, to renovate it, and to make it ready for us to be able to worship and use as a tool to facilitate ministry. So you see the breakdown, 1.7 goes to ministry, 1.3 to the new facility. Some of you, if you're asking, they're like, if you're, a, if you're a math person, a financial person, you're like, as, as New Life Church, are we in the ballpark to be able to, to accomplish that? Well, year to date, meaning year to date, $1,055,643 has been given to New Life Church. I hope that gives you confidence that $3 million is highly achievable. Yes. And let me tell you something, last week I shared this, that $3 million is very attainable for us in what we do have and in the faithfulness we've seen from you, New Life Church. But it doesn't account for the miracle that God can and will do. You see, because when the disciples, right, had two fish and five loaves of bread, 
that wasn't going to feed the 25,000 people. But when they gave it into the hands of Jesus, Jesus does something that he always does. He multiplies it and uses it as a blessing to feed more than you can even comprehend at this moment. And so it takes greater faith. Last week we talked about greater faith. Do you trust God with what you do have? Do you trust that he will do something miraculous with it? And so this is, this is a target that we have together, a goal. But it takes greater faith. Last week I asked you to ask this question. Today, which means last week, last Sunday, I asked you to ask this question of yourself. Will you make a commitment to make a commitment? In other words, will you make a commitment for your faith to grow? Will you take a step of faith and allow God to do something in your life, but then also through your life? And so that was last week's message, greater faith. Go back to it. But this, this week, I kind of want to talk about a topic of greater responsibility. Now, the great theologian, uh, Spider-Man's uncle, He said, with what? Great response, with what was, I, I forgot the phrase. With great power comes great response. See, I need you to interact because I don't always get it. I, I need you to give me feedback. Kids, you know Spider-Man. Spider-Man's uncle said, with great power comes great responsibility. Listen to me. Jesus, if he's deposited his Holy Spirit, God himself inside of you, means he's given you what? He's given you great the question is, is do you accept the great responsibility? Have you accepted the great responsibility? And so I want to show you this, or actually I'm not going to show it to you on the screen, but I want to tell you a story found in Matthew 25. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 25. You can, I think we can click off this. Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. Jesus is telling a story. To illustrate something to his followers, to, to illustrate something to, to, to his disciples. And so if you're a believer in Christ, this, this message is for you. The parable says, the story goes, again, it will be like a man going on a journey. Sounds like Jesus leaving earth, going to heaven, and then saying this. He called his servants and he entrusted his property to them you got to understand something right off the bat that God has given you everything that you have. Nothing that you have has been given to you except by God himself. You're not an owner, you're a steward. Let me prove it to you. When you die, are you going to take it with you to the grave? Are you going to take your house with you, your car with you? Are, are you going to... Some of you might think, well, I may, I'm going to leave it in my inheritance to some people, but yeah, but they're going to die. And what are they going to, they're not going to take it with them. They're going to leave it. God owns it all. And so first thing that we got to understand is, is that God is the provider of everything we, that we have. He created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. And, and, and he tells so many stories about how he cares for us and looks after us and provides for us. He said, man, if I, if I care for the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how much more would I care for you as someone who I dearly love, my, one of my children? He is the provider of all that we have. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm like a man going on a journey. He's gone to heaven and he called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Notice that word, he trusted it. He entrusted it to you. He entrusted it to me. To one, he says, he gave five talents of money. To another, he gave two talents. And to another, one talent. Each according to his ability. Now, some of you, you have a lot. And it's been given to you because, listen to me very clearly, what, what Jesus has said, it's been given to you because of what? Your ability. Your ability to be trustworthy in what God has given to you. He goes on and he says, right, to five, I, I, I gave five, and, and then he gives two, and then to one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. 
Again, because of his ability and because he was trustworthy, he didn't just take what the owner gave to him. He didn't just take what God gave to him and just do whatever they want with it. No, they put it to work to see a, an investment, a return on investment for the money the owner gave to him. The same thing happened. The man with two gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five and said, Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You took what I had. You, you took your resources. You took your abilities. You took your, your house and your cars. You took your family. You took your, your, your inheritance. You took your kids, and you, you did something with them. He tr entrusted them to you. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. And then, check this out. Jesus said, come and share in your master's happiness. Again, he's talking about he is the provider. He's the provider of all the good things that you have. And when you put it to work, when your abilities are matched and you go out and put what God has given you to work for his purposes, man, you share in his blessings. Right last week, we saw that very clearly when the disciples had this decision. When, when, Je when they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, you gotta send these people away because we don't have anything to give them. They need to go to the restaurants to get fed. They need food, they're hungry. You've been preaching a series of messages that should have taken multiple weeks, but you did it all in one day and it's really good and we can handle it, but they, don't, they can't handle it. They need to go and get some food. They, the restaurants are clothing, cl clothing, closing. And Jesus said what to them? He said, okay, the people don't have food. You give them something to eat. To which the disciples said, we don't have anything except for the, the Long John Silver's bag that Peter stole for this, from this little kid. That's all we got. But they listened to the words of Jesus. You give them something to eat. And they brought it to Jesus. They gave them what he had. They gave Jesus what they had. And he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it back to them to distribute it to the people. The miracle didn't happen. Listen closely. The miracle did not happen until the disciples, the followers of Jesus, were faithful to what God told them to do. Let me say that again. The miracle did not take place until the disciples did what God asked them to do. What did he ask them to do? You feed them. You feed them. You, you give them something. And so we read this, we read this parable that God has given us resources. He's given us time. He's given us abilities. He's given us personalities. He's, he's given us family and resources, jobs. He's given us all abilities. And how many of y'all wish y'all had a, a little more ability? I do. And I'm going to keep working on my ability. But I can guarantee you, with what God has entrusted me with, I am not going to waste it. The man with two talents came and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents, and I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came, master, master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and scattering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid of you. I was afraid of you and went out and I did what? I hid what you gave me. Here's back what you gave to me. So Jesus entrusted this man with, with his resources. God the Father has entrusted us with our time. He has entrusted us with our abilities. He has entrusted us with our resources. He's asked us to steward them and to be generous with them for the benefit of all. And he's promised us that we will enjoy everything that he has. 
right? The disciples last week we, we talked about, they were like, we don't have anything. We have these two fish and, and, and five loaves of bread. And they put it in the hands of Jesus. Jesus blessed it, gave it back to them. They distributed it to the people to make a difference, to do greater things that even they were capable of. And because they were obedient, because they said, okay, God, yes, I will. I will, I will go give them something to eat. It began to multiply. And at the end of that story, what happened? They ended up with 12 basketfuls <laughs> of fish and bread. Each of the 12 disciples, as I put last week, got to take home a doggy bag from this scenario, from this story. And that only happened because they believed in what God had entrusted them with. They believed and they obeyed. They took responsibility for what God had given them and they did it. They acted in faith. But look at what Jesus says. And, 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 and this is hard for me to share with you, but, but man, the scriptures keep it real. Jesus kept it real. I've said this a million times. Jesus is not a namby-pamby, decaf-sipping white boy. Like he's a man's man. And sometimes he's tough. And sometimes with his kids, he, he shares stuff that is a little uncomfortable. I know that for my kids, one of my favorite things, I don't know how this has happened, but one of my daughters, one of my two daughters has just wanted to come up and, and worship with me. And can I tell you, that's like, it's, when that happens, I, like, I don't even care if you guys are here. I mean, I do. But man, what a blessing that my, my, my daughter wants to worship God with me and, 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 and be in his presence together. But think about this, the hard truth that Jesus has to say. Listen, when my daughter begins to rebel against going to sleep on time, or when, she, when I try to tell her to do something and maybe I'm trying to teach her a lesson of responsibility for what God or what I have given to her, like, hey, don't treat your toys like that because you've been entrusted with this toy, don't break it. And you've been entrusted with a sister, treat her well. Like there's some things as parents like we know is good for our kids, right? Jesus is teaching this parable because he knows that this is good for you. It's good for me to understand that we've been entrusted with things that God has given us. And his master replied to the one who was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. In other words, you've been entrusted with stuff. You've hidden it from God. You haven't invested it in the kingdom of God. And look what happens. They also, wait, it's really small, <laughs> which shows my age. I need, I need a magnifying glass. Here's what Jesus said to the one who wasted it, who, who hid it. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the 10 talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him and throw that worthless servant outside in the darkness where there will be weeping and ganashing of teeth. I don't know about you, but I would like to be a person that trusts God, that, that, that believes in him, right? Whoever believes in me will do greater things. And I wanna do what God says. And he's entrusted me, listen, he's entrusted you, he's entrusted me with the kingdom of God right here and now. Let me show you, did you know, which some of you do, and, and, and do or don't know this, and it's fine, the temple of God, the, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was the portable church. Right, when, they got, when the Israelites got out of Egyptian slavery, they set up and tore down every single week, every single place they went, they set up the tabernacle of God, which where the worship of God would take place. Then he gave David the vision through Solomon to build the temple of God, right? The place where God would be worshiped, the, the place where people would go to worship God. Did you know that the temple of God was built and destroyed and rebuilt three times? I'm gonna show you this verse in Ezra where the temple was being rebuilt for the second time after it was destroyed. This is what Cyrus, the king of Persia, says. This is Cyrus, a, a king of Persia. He was a, a godly king who feared God and wanted to live according to what God told him to do. And so this is Ezra. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. 
which didn't exist, our kingdom, America, didn't exist at the time. And he has appointed me to build the temple for him at Jerusalem in Judea, Judah, the city of God. And he tells the people, any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, you got to understand something about this context. In the book of Ezra, because the people of God had been attacked, they were scattered. The people of God were scattered. It kind of sounds like the church of Jesus Christ today. Because of COVID, because of political situations, because of what the world is doing to Christians and saying about Christians, Christians are isolated and intimidated by the world around them. Does anyone agree? They're scattered. They're isolated. And God wants to bring God's people back together in strength. Why? to rebuild the temple of God, to rebuild the focus on the church of Jesus Christ where he is worshiped. And so what did he do? He gave Cyrus the vision. Man, build the temple. And then he says, any of his people among you, in other words, there were people scattered all throughout this region. It wasn't just people in the city of Jerusalem. They were scattered all over the place. And he said, hey, you Christians, you believers, Go back and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel. The God who is in Jerusalem and may their God be with them. You gotta know something. Jesus said he would never leave you or forsake you. The God who lives inside of you, he is with you. And then he says, in any locality where survivors now be living. Again, they were under attack. They, they had gone to war, they were isolated, they were intimidated. And if there's any survivors living among you in any locality, man, in Pawpaw, in St. Joe, in, in Kalamazoo, in Portage, in, in Ashtimo. Wherever they are, wherever the survivors may be, made them, let them come back and the people are to provide the people who are building the temple, provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock. And Now we don't need livestock. And if you wanna give us livestock, can you sell it first and then give us the, the return? to build the house, because if you give me livestock, I won't know what to do with it. That's just a side note. And with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Listen, as we go into the season of greater and we're talking, we are talking about getting a permanent location. We're talking about going from being a tabernacle of set up and tear down every single weekend to getting a place where we can facilitate ministry 24-7, 365 days a year. But you need to understand something. God has always used the people to provide for the building of God's place of worship. And this is Jesus. We can go ahead, it's fine, I'll, I'll, I'll click it. This is Jesus. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. In that message, in, in that testimony that, 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 that Jamie and Tim so beautifully put forth, Tim said, the, as, said, said this statement, he said, if you're looking for being a part of what's blessed, because so, so many of us, we were looking, we're saying, God, will you bless this? Will you bless this? Will you bless this? In reality, God is telling you to plug into and, into and to invest in what he is already doing. Do you wanna know what God is doing? Do you wanna know what Jesus is doing? He's building his church. He's building his church. What is he doing? He's building his church. Let's say it, let's say it with, what is Jesus building? Now, what is the church? The, the church is a colossal collection of moral follow-ups. Say that 10 times fast. It, it's a group of people who are un, imperfect, seeking a perfect God, believing in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Man, we're not perfect people, but we're pursuing God and we're pursuing his ways and we're being obedient to his ways. So you want to get involved in what is blessed by God? Get involved in the local church. Why? Because it's already blessed. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. For some of you, you're like, man, how do I, how do I make sure that my family is not going not gonna to suffer? How do I make sure that my, my business is, is fireproof? How do, I, how do I make sure that, that everything is going to be, going to be all right? 
put your faith in the Lord and be a part of what God is building. Because here's the deal, some of us, we're so focused on trying to build our own kingdoms and, and God has entrusted us with resources, some of us 10, some of us two, some of us one, and some of us with one or even 10 or five, we've hidden it from the Lord, expecting God to do something miraculous. And as we found out last week, God doesn't do anything miraculous unless we put it in the hands of himself. Let me show you this verse. Again, with great power comes great responsibility. Jesus continues and says, I, I will give you, who's you, believers? I will give you the, the keys of the kingdom. Again, Jesus, he blessed the bread, he blessed the two fish, he, he broke it and gave it back to the disciples. And Jesus says, greater are the things that we, you and I will do because he's gone to the Father. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given you the keys, which is what? He's given you responsibility. He's entrusted you. Think about that. Think about the coaches that you admire the most, the bosses. Think about the teachers. Think about the parents. Man, the, the, the times in which you were entrusted, you were empowered, they gave you ownership. They said, you take it and do something extraordinary with it. It's what Jesus has entrusted to us. He's entrusted to us the kingdom. Now, for us, over the last four years, God has entrusted us with this key, in this location, in this building, to use once a week. Now, God has given us this key, to utilize it to worship him and to expand his kingdom, not just in this radius, but in the entire radius of our region. He's given us great responsibility. He's entrusted you. Did you know that God hasn't just given me this key? He's given you this key. He's given us this key. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? I think about the entirety of the Bible, and I think about all the times in which God interacted with people. He called Moses a stuttering murderer to free the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. And, and, and what did he say? Uh, Moses said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a stutterer. I, I don't speak well. And, 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 but according to his ability, he stepped up and said, okay, God, yes, I will do it. I think about Esther, when all the godly people in the region, Esther went before her, her, her husband, the king, and said, king, listen, your dude, your second in command is about to destroy everybody. Will you save them? She took a step of faith to save people. What if she wouldn't have done that? What if she wouldn't have accepted her responsibility in that moment in time? And we look at all the disciples, we look at the people from, from Genesis to the maps in the back who have made an impact for the kingdom of God. Can I tell you something? None of those people that you read, out and read about in the Bible live today. You do. I do. They're not coming back. They're not, they're not coming back to do something with this key. You and I have been entrusted with the keys to God's kingdom. He's gone. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. What are you and I gonna do with what God has trusted us with? What are we gonna do? And so this season, we have to realize that from vision to reality, right, from vision to reality, responsibility requires action from all of us, not just a few of us. Can I tell you something? I love, did you guys, when you watched that video of the testimonies and, 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 and saw all the things that the, 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 the Mitchells do? Can I tell you something? That's not okay. I love their hearts to say, yes, I'll do it, send me. But the reason they're doing all of that is because some of you are sitting here comfortable. You've been entrusted with your time. You've been entrusted with this life for God to worship and to use it for greater things to be accomplished here on the earth. 
And for the life of me, I, I, I've never been a person, and, and I know some of you are, and I know it's okay, but this is a, a life-giving group of people. We come together to do extraordinary things together. You heard testimonies last week of people who were on the verge of, 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 of taking their lives, but they came to New Life Church, and they found freedom from depression and anxiety. God touched and changed their lives and gave them a family that they can belong to. And this is why we do what we do. But responsibility requires action from all of us. And so when we say, make a commitment to make a commitment, that's, that's 100% of us, not a few of us, to all of us. And so the question is, will you take ownership and responsibility of what Jesus has given you and I to build right now in this city? I wanna show you, if you take out those cards, if you take out these cards with you, on, on, on one side, you'll see a ladder. And we call it the giving ladder. And, and someone who's a first time giver, you're, you're literally saying this question or you're asking this question. You're like, what do I do with my money? In other words, you might not be aware of that literally everything you have has been given to you by God. Your abilities, your mind, your life. Every part of who you are, God has given it to you. And then the next, the next one is occasional giver. What do I do with God's money? You're like, man, should I give it to the Kalamazoo Gospel Mission? Should I give it to the church? Should I give it to, to, to good deeds? Should I give it to alms? You, you, you do this occasionally, and you're trying to be obedient. And then a consistent giver says, what does God say for me to do with God's money? Like I ask him, God, what do you want to do with the resources that you've given to me? I've asked that question. A tither is what does God want me to give from God's resources? And if you look at the Bible from cover to cover and Jesus, Jesus affirmed this, tithing is, is giving the first to, to God. Why? Because the first commandment of God was there shall not be any gods above me. And if you give, most of you, I, I, just to shorten this message, most of us give our first to the United States government. We need a better God than the United States government. We need a better God than the state government. And so many of us, we're giving our first, the tithe, the first 10% of our income to the government expecting something miraculous to take place. But can I tell you, the only place that something miraculous will take place in is in the hands of God. And then generous giver. We want to be a people that leads the way in irrational generosity. And that question is, what does God want me to keep from God's resources? You know, as we started this campaign, I, I want you to share with you some, some, some real things. I got to wrap this up real quick because I'm already two minutes over and the kids' ministry needs me to be done on time. We started this over a year and a half ago. Our trustees and I began dis discussing, man, what is next for New Life Church? What should we do? What should we be pursuing? And in the midst of that, we had so many church planner friends, churches just like ours who meet in a high school, who got kicked out of their high schools during COVID and were not allowed to come back. Can we praise God that that never happened to us? Like, like seriously. Now, I want to be careful with saying that because that doesn't mean that we have more favor the more, more favor of God than our church planter friends. That's just not true. Okay, I hope you hear that. But we have been blessed to be able to stay in this facility. But during that time, we're like, what's, we gotta figure out what's next. We gotta be able to do ministry more than just once a week in a high school setting up and tearing down. And so last June, we began sharing this vision with more of our leaders. We began sharing it with our staff and our elders and, 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 our, and our team got together. And, and we decided we're gonna go first. Man, if we're gonna ask the people of God to commit, when, when Ezra said, man, go tell the people to come and bring their resources to build the temple of God, and, and the same thing when David did it in 1 Chronicles 29, he, the people, David went first. And so as a leader, we started this commitment first. And so last year when we started this, Kelsey and I went from being tithers Kelsey's my wife, she was up here singing. We went from being tithers, bringing 10% of our income to the Lord to going to 
Now, that's not to pat ourselves on the back. I'm just telling you, we went first. I'm not asking you to do something that I and myself and our leaders have not already committed to do. This year, when we hit June, and we were asking God, God, what would you have us to do? God told Kelsey and I, he's not telling you this. He could tell you even more than this. He could tell me this. He said, go to 14%. And so Kelsey and I gave 14%, have been giving 14% of our income to the local church for this campaign. And we've committed to do that over the, ne- over the next 24 months. We also gave out of our abundance. We gave a special gift. And so you ask God what you should give and you be quick, be, be, be quick um, to respond to him in obedience. But where are you on the giving ladder? And I wanna give you greater faith in action. These dates, you gotta write these down. On October 23rd, we are going to have a worship event in the new facility, in the new building on Portage Road between Airborne and Salvation Army. And so we're asking people to, to go first. Our elders, our trustees, our staff, we've all gone. The kids ministry is gonna kill me, I gotta say this. We've had 15 families, 15 households that have gone first already. And remember the $3 million goal? 15 of our households have already committed over a million dollars. Not only that, but we're a tithing to missions organization. So every dollar that comes in, we tithe out. And I think, I think, I believe, because we've been trustworthy in the, in the resources that God's given to us, that he's blessing us even more. We've had two people, listen to me, two people, two, two families who don't even go to church here. One lives in Florida and one lives in, in Texas. They don't even go to church here and have already given $175,000 for us to get into a new home. I'm sharing that with you to give you courage to trust God. That there are people who are called by God to use their resources to advance the kingdom of God in Kalamazoo who don't even live here. Why? Because they have a heart for God and they want to be obedient to him when he leads them. That's the only way that happens. And so we've got to take responsibility for what Jesus has entrusted to us. And so take note, advanced commitment is leaders going first. November 13th is when all of us together will bring these, con- these commitment cards, we'll fill them out, and we will come together to bring an offering to the Lord where we make our commitments for the next 24 months. And we say, God, this is what we have. This is what you've led us to do, and we're going to commit it to you. We're going to put it in your hands in faith that you're going to multiply it and bless not just me, but the city of Kalamazoo as we do this together. And then on December 4th, to kickstart this 24 months, we're gonna do what's called a big give. This is us going big on our first gift. Again, Kelsey and I did this in June. We started giving at 14% in June. We gave our first big gift in June. Our leaders did the same. Our trustees, our, our elders did the same thing, our staff. And we're asking you, the people, will you be a part of what God's building? Because just like the disciples left, listen to me, just like the disciples left with extra and with more, man, when you're that person with 10 talents or, or two talents and you put it to work and you, you bring it to God, what, what did he say? You get to share in the blessings of God. You get to share in it. And so what is this? What is advanced commitment? Again, it's leaders go first. You can register for it on on this card. Again, you can go to the app and register for it. You can take your phones out really quick. Really quick, really, really, because I gotta move. But I also wanna share you the vision gap. We'll put it back up on the screen before we leave, okay? The vision gap. We currently have $450,000 in the bank. That's cash money. We need $850,000 to unleash this project. We gotta go in and do renovations. We've gotta, this building hasn't been inhabited in seven years. Those of you who have been in it and seen it, you've seen the video, you see that there's a lot of amazing things about this particular facility for kids' ministry classrooms. 
for, for worship environments, for a coffee shop. There's a coffee shop practically already built into it. But there's things we got to do to renovate it. But I want to tell you that out of this $850,000 or out of that one3 600000 is going to renovating the actual hard-nosed facility. The rest of it is going to stuff that we will own. Because some of you asked, what about stuff that we own? All the AVL equipment that we need to put in it, we will own. All the furniture, we will own. So we are investing in stuff that we will own. But can I tell you something? We're not investing in a building. We're not investing in AVL systems. We're not investing in furniture. We're investing in God changing people's lives. That's what we're investing in. You've been entrusted. What are you going to do with the responsibility of what you've been entrusted with? And so where are you on the giving ladder? And, 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 and will you... Take a faith step up. You've been entrusted. You ask God what he would have you to do, and you be faithful to him. And I promise you, you watch him bless and multiply like you've never seen before. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And God, right now, we pray that you would begin speaking to us directly in ways that you want us to respond. God, I pray that we would understand that, that you are the first giver, that you gave us life and life abundantly. You, you, you gave us our breath, you gave us the resources of our minds, you gave us our, our talents and our abilities. And God, we don't just wanna use that for our own benefit, we wanna use that for your kingdom's purposes that you've given us the key to unlock blessing in the world around us. And right now, Jesus, we are saying yes to you. I wanna be a part of that. God, I pray that you would fulfill your promise to let these people who participate share in your goodness and in your abundance. God, right now, I pray that people who maybe are checking out church for the first time, whether it's online or here in the room, that they would understand that, that we are people of faith, that, that we are beggars. Listen to me, we are beggars in need of bread. Jesus is the bread of life. And some of us have just received that bread first before you. And, and you're here because of their faithfulness to God. But Jesus was God's tithe. For John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world, for God so loved you and me that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but receive, be given eternal life. Friends, the gift is right before you. You don't have to earn it. Jesus paid for it on your behalf with his life. All you have to do is accept it. Turn from your sin and turn to Jesus and receive salvation and eternal life. On a count of three, if that's you, I wanna invite you to raise your hand in faith. One, two, three. Three, shoot your hand up high and hold it up. Say, Jesus, I turn from my sin. I receive eternal life. Now from your heart to God, say, I turn from my sin and I turn to you, Jesus, for life and life abundantly. And right now, God, I pray that you would fill me, fill my life, my soul, my spirit with the Holy Spirit of God. Come inside of me, Lord, and change me and give me a life and life of abundance that you promised. In Jesus' name, amen.